a final farewell to a president. George H.W. Bush has gone home to Texas tonight after his state funeral here in Washington. Friends and family honored the president and the man with rights and remembrance. President George H.W. Bush began his last journey early today at the U.S. Capitol, accompanied by the Bush family and the melancholy chords of the U.S. Navy Band that set the tone on this National Day of Mourning. The 41st president's casket was driven through the heart of Washington, passing by the White House a final time. Then arriving at the Washington National Cathedral for the invitation only funeral. Outside, onlookers lined the street to pay their own respects. President Bush was my commander in chief when I was in the military. So it was just fitting for me to come out and say goodbye to him. You have to show honor to things that, you, that matter. And Mr. Bush mattered. So this is my way of saying that he mattered in my life. Inside a rare gathering of leaders and luminaries led by President Trump and four former presidents, cabinet secretaries, senators, and Supreme Court justices. Over the next two hours, they celebrated George H.W. Bush with praise, humor, and at times, tears. Presidential historian John Meacham recalled the moment that history might have taken a very different turn when a young Navy pilot was shot down over the Pacific during World War II. The future 41st president of the United States was alone. Sensing that his men had not made it, he was overcome. He felt the weight of responsibility as a nearly physical burden, and he wept. Then, at four minutes shy of noon, a submarine emerged to rescue the down pilot. George Herbert Walker Bush was safe. The story, his story and ours would go on by God's grace. Through the ensuing decades, President Bush would frequently ask, nearly daily, he'd ask himself, why me? Why was I spared? And in a sense, the rest of his life was a perennial effort to prove himself worthy of his salvation on that distant morning. Mr. Bush, Meacham said, famously kept a frenetic a pace race. from he speed golf all. to cigarette boats and even to campaigning. He never slowed down. On the primary campaign trail in New Hampshire once, he grabbed the hand of a department store mannequin asking for votes. When he realized his mistake, he said, never know. Got to ask. Meacham called Mr. Bush America's last voice, great man. soldier statesman, presiding over the fall of the Soviet Bush Union and rallying a coalition to fight Mr. the Rogers first Gulf War. He stood in the breach in the Cold War against totalitarianism. He stood in the breach in Washington against unthinking partisanship. He stood in the breach against tyranny and discrimination. The George Herbert Walker Bush who survived that fiery fall into the waters of the Pacific three quarters of a century ago, made our lives and the lives of nations freer, better, warmer, and nobler. That was his mission. That was his heartbeat. And if we listen closely enough, we can hear that heartbeat even now for it's the heartbeat of a lion, a lion who not only led us, but who loved us. That's why him, that's why he was spared. The funeral drew world leaders past and present. 
including former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, whose term in office overlapped Mr. Bush's terms as president and vice president. He recalled one of their first encounters. At his first NATO meeting in Brussels, as the new American president, he sat opposite me, actually, that day. George was taking copious notes as the heads of government spoke, ending only when the Secretary General of NATO firmly decreed a coffee break. George put down his pen, walked over to me and said, Brian, I've just learned the fundamental principle of international affairs. I said, what's that, George? He said, the smaller the country, the longer the speech. <laughs> Mulroney had special praise for the late president's dealings with Canada, including the trade deal ultimately signed by President Clinton and more recently rejected by President Trump. President Bush was also responsible for the North American Free Trade Agreement, recently modernized and improved by new administrations, which created the largest and richest free trade area in the history of the world. But aside from policy, the former prime minister remembered a friend and Labor Day weekends at the Bush family home in Kennebunkport, Maine. He led me down the porch at Walker's Point to the side of the house that fronts the ocean and pointed to a small, simple plaque that had been unobtrusively installed just some days earlier. It read C-A-V-U. George said, Brian, this stands for Sealing and Visibility Unlimited. When I was a terrified 18 to 19-year-old pilot in the Pacific, those, those were the words we hoped to hear before takeoff. It meant perfect flying. And that's the way I feel about our life today. C-A-V-U. Everything is perfect. Barr and I could not have asked for better lives. We are truly happy and truly at peace. Former Wyoming Senator Alan Simpson was another close friend of Mr. Bush, a bond forged through decades together in Washington. He was a man of such great humility. Those who travel the high road of humility in Washington, D.C. are not bothered by heavy traffic. Simpson fondly recalled nights that the two men and their wives spent together enjoying plays and music. One night, the four of us went to see Michael Crawford singing the songs of Andrew Lloyd Webber. All four of us were singing as we went back to the White House. Don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> and tidbits from Phantom of the Opera and other magic of Webber. And a few days later, he's getting hammered by the press for some extraordinarily petty bit of trivia. And suddenly he sings out, don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> the press then wrote that he was finally losing his marbles. The famed Simpson wit portrayed Mr. Bush as someone who loved a good joke, but who was so much more as well. He never lost his sense of humor. Humor is the universal solvent against the abrasive elements of life. That's what humor is. He never hated anyone. He knew what his mother and my mother always knew. Hatred corrodes the container it's carried in. The most decent and honorable person I ever met was my friend George Bush, one of nature's noble men. Perhaps the most poignant moments of the day came when the 43rd president, George W. Bush, rose to eulogize his father. He mixed humor and pathos, recalling a man of boundless energy and a zest for life. At age 90, George H.W. Bush parachuted out of an aircraft and landed on the grounds of St. Anne's by the sea in Kennebunkport, Maine. The church where his mom was married and where he worshiped often. Mother liked to say he chose a location just in case the chute didn't open. 
in his 90s. He took great delight when his closest pal, James A. Baker, smuggled a bottle of Grey Goose vodka into his hospital room. Apparently, it paired well with the steak Baker had delivered from Morton's. <laughs> to his very last days, Dad's life was instructive. As he aged, he taught us how to grow with dignity, humor, and kindness. And when the good Lord finally called, how to meet him with courage and with the joy of the promise of what lies ahead. The former president paid One tribute to his father's time, appeal for understand. a kinder, gentler and nation and his call to volunteer. Dad taught us that public service is noble and necessary, that one can serve with integrity and hold true to the important values like faith and family. He strongly believed that it was important to give back to the community and country in which one lived. He recognized that serving others enriched the giver's soul. To us, his was the brightest of a thousand points of light. But he told of how the late president had faced darkness early in his family life, the loss of his daughter Robin to leukemia. Jeb and I were too young to remember the pain and agony he and mom felt when our three-year-old sister died. We only learned later that dad, a man of quiet faith, prayed for her daily. He was sustained by the love of the Almighty and the real and enduring love of her mom. Dad always believed that one day he would hug his precious Robin again. Ultimately, the 43rd president painted the 41st as a public man of distinction and a private man of warmth, leaving a family to grieve a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. He was firm in his principles and supportive as we began to seek our own ways. He encouraged and comforted, but never steered. We tested his patience. I know I did. But he always responded with the great gift of unconditional love. Last Friday, when I was told he had minutes to live, I called him. The guy answered the phone, said he, I think he can hear you, but he hadn't said anything for most of the day. I said, Dad, I love you and you've been a wonderful father. And the last words he would ever say on earth were, I love you too. So through our tears, let us know the blessings of knowing and loving you, a great and noble man, the best father a son or daughter could have. <laughs> and in our grief, let us smile knowing that dad is hugging Robin and holding mom's hand again. The rector of the Bush family's home Episcopal Church in Houston was at the president's bedside in his final hours. The Reverend Russell Levinson delivered the homily today. It was a beautiful end. It was a beautiful beginning. For a moment, but a moment only, that dear point of light we know as George Herbert Walker Bush dimmed but it now shines brighter than it ever before has. So, Mr. President, mission complete. Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome to your eternal home, where ceiling and visibility are unlimited, and life goes on forever. The service concluded with Irish tenor Ronan Tynan, a Paralympian, singing the Lord's Prayer. And the nationally televised service came to a close. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. With the benediction, a slow procession carried the flag-draped casket from the cathedral to a waiting motorcade. A departure ceremony followed at Joint Base Andrews in Maryland, including a 21-gun salute. And then, 
President George H.W. Bush left Washington for the last time. The casket was flown to Houston, where Mr. Bush will lie in repose overnight at St. Martin's Episcopal Church. There's a private service tomorrow with burial to follow, alongside his wife Barbara and daughter Robin on his presidential library grounds at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. And just moments ago, the plane that's been dubbed Air Force Special Mission 41 landed in Houston with the Bush family to bring President Bush 41 home for this final time. The plane has landed. These are live pictures coming in from Houston, from the airport there where the plane has landed and they, are wait, they will wait to watch as he goes home.